So, as I said, um, I'm a principal engineer at Cloudera. He's a senior staff at Cloudera. We are pretty much um, architects and leads for the tooling that we do at Cloudera and the DevOps teams. Um, we use Kubernetes, OCP, VMs, um, in-house, in the cloud, everywhere. So, and also we do a bunch of tooling. So we build around 10,000 containers a day, um, and we have around 50 plus products that we offer. And it's a very vast and huge scale that we operate at Cloudera. So for us, I mean, we have multiple products, and pretty much except to everything else is in container mode at this point. So um, we, we basically deal everything in containers every day. So what we did was, in order to eliminate the duplicate uh, base images, we just normalized the base images so that all applications could use a single set of uh, base images, which helped us in maintaining and rolling out the CV issues. And then we have a bunch of third-party images that our applications use in production. Um, even this, we try to bring it in-house, uh, run the CV scans and normalize them and make sure they are security compliance, um, they meet the security compliance before we roll it out. And then the application images, this is our uh, IP. Uh, so Cloudera, we generate like around 1,500 application images overall. And then the volume of builds that we do, there are a number of images that we handle on a daily basis. So that's around 10,000 images that we build a day, and our registry size is of 40 TB, even after regular cleanup and everything. And um, as I mentioned earlier, um, security is a big um, step in our cloud era, whatever we do, because we need to meet uh, the security compliance standards and everything. So CV fixes and the CIS benchmarking. We do a lot of image hardening steps um, in our images that we roll out to the customers. And once we have hardened the images, I mean, it reduces the area uh, for the security attacks. And CVE management, as I mentioned before, we track CVEs um, using Aquasec, we scan all the images, and we try to fix our critical and major CVE issues um, as soon as possible, and we just roll them out. So everything was going smooth. Um, both our lives were happy. We were just functioning it, and one day Apple came up with their silicon processor. And suddenly we saw these Macs coming into Cloudera, and the developers started complaining that they couldn't use these images on their machines to test it out and do uh, development work, right? So that uh, moves us to the topic uh, multi arch at Cloudera. So, with the introduction of Apple Silicon, uh, MacBooks, we, we, were, we were asked to solve the problem of developers using the images in their work laptops, and that introduced us to multi-arch images. And after that, we found more use cases where we could actually roll it out to the customers as well to use them on um, ARM-based machines in the production, which could actually cut down their cost by 40% and giving the same uh, throughput. So, so we wanted the ability to run these Docker images on multiple CPU architectures. And as I said, the Graviton, the AWS Cloud offerings for ARM and everything, I mean, these are eco-friendly CPU architecture because for less compute, you could still get the same throughput and reduce the cost as well. And we wanted to achieve um, seamless migration from one architecture to the other, rather than building images for different architectures and releasing separately. So we wanted to have one solution that works uh, on any architecture. And better performance and cost saving. Um, and then as I mentioned about the third party images or the external images that we use in Cloudera, so now that we introduced the topic of multi-arch, the first problem that we saw was how do we, build, how do we bring these multi-arch images from external and, and roll it out? So with the regular Docker images, we didn't have a problem because it's a regular Docker pull and push. So we used to pull from external registries, be it Google, Microsoft, Docker Hub, wherever it is. And then we used to host them in our registries internally. But with this multi-arch, I mean, it comes with many flavors. We didn't want to tag or track um, images per platform kind of a model. So what do we do now to scale the external images 
and still not break the developer functionality and the production of functionality. So it turned very complex. Um, if you were to treat image per architecture, we just made it simple by using Scopio. Right? So Scopio came to our rescue. So Scopio was able to handle everything um, with a single command and still treats images as a single image, though internally it tracks uh, different architecture-wise. So we were able to uh, perform various operations on the container images and the image repositories. Uh, in addition to just pulling and pushing the images to our registry using Scopio, there is one more functionality that we were able to leverage Scopio with, which I will cover in the next sections. So using Scopio, yeah, we were able to copy all these multi-arch images from the external sources without losing any platform-specific data. So this is a, a quick way of um, just demonstrating. So we just do a single pull command, um, same tag. We don't mention anything specific to architecture. But when the uh, pull comes on, right, it just considers the host CPU architecture. And based on that, it resolves automatically to the right uh, image layer. So that's the external images. Now let's move on to building the multi-arch images at Cloudera for our applications. So to build these multi-arch images, uh, we um, adopted BuildX instead of the regular Docker build um, because it was able to uh, build multi-arch images. And we also leveraged Chemo to emulate the target architecture during our build process. Instead of building our applications on different platforms for different uh, architectures, we just used x86 as our base and then still continued uh, building or uh, generating multi-arch using uh, Chemo emulator. So thus, we were able to build and generate images for multiple platforms, AMD, ARM, Apple Silicon, V8, etc. So we could also have done differently, like using BuildX. BuildX has an inbuilt capability of um, doing a distributed image builds on different architecture using Kubernetes. But at Cloudera, we didn't have this architecture, and that was a big uh, project by itself to support multi-architectures I mean, in the Kubernetes cluster. Because um, our Kubernetes is in-house, and we didn't have any ARM-based machines in our data center. So what did we do? So we used a Docker container driver which, um, with emulators for different architectures. So our host is still uh, x86, and we have different operating systems running on it. But using the BuildX and the Docker container, we were able to build our uh, multi-arch images internally. So these are the set of commands that we used um, before we did any Docker builds. We used to set the context. Instead of using the Kubernetes distributed model, we were using the emulators, right? So we used this open source project to run and build uh, containers for any architecture. So thus, we were able to build uh, distributed um, Docker images for ARM, PPCs, um, and various architectures. But emulators do have their own drawbacks. Um, it's not a perfect solution, because it does not provide the full range of functionality that is available in the native environment. I mean, as opposed to building on an ARM-based machine, emulators do have some uh, disadvantages when it comes to native libraries and stuff. But, um, and, and then it also could result in missing or incomplete features in the built images. But that wasn't a problem in Cloudera because, I mean, for what we are doing, it's not really depending on any native libraries in the ARM-based um, architecture. So this is a, a simple workflow that we um, designed and implemented. So without changing much functionality in our, in our regular build system on how we generate uh, a regular x86 images, we just made little changes and, and, thus, and still were able to achieve multi-arch images. So depending on what kind of image we are trying to generate, it uses either Docker build or Docker buildx. And then uh, once the build is comp uh, successful, the image is successfully generated, I mean, depending again on the, arch, uh, the architecture of the image, we either do a Docker tag or we used Scopio to generate these OCI tarballs. I will explain why we had to use this OCI tarball model uh, in the next slides. 
And then once the manifest is created, we used to either um, stitch it up or just push it directly to the registry. So um, as I said, we were using Docker build for a while, like a few years now. I mean, the whole build system, developers, scripts, everything was tied up with build, uh, Docker build commands and everything. But now with the buildx, we didn't want to um, make it a big deal in the, de in the development community at Cloudera, like as in to change the build scripts and everything from Docker to Docker buildx. So what we did was we just um, came up with a small wrapper around the Docker CLI, and that wrapper, it manipulates the Docker build command um, to be like Docker buildx, and, it's, and a little more tweaks we were able to achieve it. So we, we were able to successfully switch to buildx without uh, disrupting any developer workflow. And also the buildx, by default, it creates the SBOM um, so that it has all the Docker manifest and everything that we could um, use it. And one of the disadvantages of this is it's not compatible with the older versions of Docker, which we were having in production, and they were not yet ready to move to multi-arch. So we were, to, uh, we were also challenged to do it backward compatible. So we just used this flag uh, that buildx provides and Thus, we were able to achieve backward compatibility. So um, another thing we had to do was improvising the manifest generation code that we had uh, to create the multi-arch images and distribute them correctly. So we improved that uh, to create manifest lists, which allowed users to pull based on the architecture of the underlying platform. Um, so. And also we use Harbor and ECR for all our registry storage purposes. And these registries, they support multi-arch out of the box, and we had no issues um, continuing using them. And uh, previously I mentioned about the OCI tarballs in the flow chart, right? So let's look at what these OCI tarballs are and why we had to do this. So traditionally at Cloudera, what we do is we only do a Docker build from the build scripts, and then we have a build framework that takes all these built images and then tags them uh, depending on the registries and uploads to the registry. But we do it as a final step of the build rather than uh, building every image and pushing it. We used to make sure that if an application produces like say 10 images, we want all those 10 images to be generated successfully before we even start publishing them. So that we don't end up with partial build images in the uh, registry and making it a problem for cleanup and everything. Right? So for that, we, we, treated as, uh, we treated build and push as two different sections and actions. Um, so build happens within the build step, whereas push is actually a wrapper, a, a, a section in the build framework that actually takes all the images that are built and it pushes them to the registry. So that was with the x86 model, with a single platform. Right Now with multi-arch, of the Docker buildx, by default, it publishes every image as it builds to the registry. And uh, it breaks our fundamental uh, approach as not to push partial images, right? partial built images. So what did we do? Um, we didn't want to continue with that, so we had to uh, do a, a separate design for that. So we leveraged OCI tarballs. So using the buildx, we were able to generate OCI tarballs, which which still live in the uh, work, local workspace. The reason why we couldn't do it with buildx is the built images for Kimo, using Kumo uh, emulators, they don't save the images in the local uh, Docker workspace, right? It rather pushes directly from the emulators. But whereas uh, here, to save the images locally in the, uh, the Docker's workspace, we had to leverage um, create by creating OCI tarballs. And once we create the OCI tarballs for all the images, and if all the images are built successfully, then we take these OCI tarballs and push them to the uh, registry. And that's how we were able to um, ensure the atomicity and consistency across all the builds. So this is a simple uh, uh, command that we had to use before generating the Docker images. And that enabled us to create um, OCI tarballs using buildx and not just push images directly once a image is generated. That, uh, that's the whole image generation part. So next is we need to sign the images. So that's where uh, we uh, will see the next section. Yeah. 
Thanks, Shri. Uh, next step is, you know, uh, now you, we build the images. So next, uh, you know, uh, improving the supply chain security and, you know, in keeping the integrity of the images. So how are we handling it in Cloudera? Sorry, no. So, like, there are various challenges signing and, uh, you know, verifying container images that we build. Like, there are multiple tools available and, you know, multiple tools comes up with uh, different features. So what we had to do? So, you know, we had to, we had evaluated different tools and we came up with a solution. And why do we need, you know, container attestation and integrity? The first one is, you know, trustworthiness of the product. Like as the many supply chain product, you know that we'll have to maintain that, hey, this image is coming from Cloudera. There is nobody in the middle attack, you know, can go and change the images, make the, modify the images and deploy in the customer environment. To do that, you know, we are using container attestation. And also it maintains the Salsa level two standard and protect from supply chain attacks. So these are the different things, you know, uh, we kind of evaluated and come up with a solution. So Notary, so we, this is one of the provider that we have evaluated. The one of the pros is like, you know, it is easy to use with Docker CLI. But with the container world, we use Podman, Docker CLI, and different kind of CLI, you know, for the building container images. And it, it is easy to integrate with OpenShift. And also it supports, you know, PKCS uh, 11, via GPG. But the main con with Notary is like, you'll have to maintain the signature server. So maintaining signature server when you're operating in a you know, large model, maintaining the signature server is going to be operational overhead. So for that, what we want is like, we preferred serverless solution. And also there are multiple cloud native, you know, uh, service solutions. For example, that is uh, AWS image signer from AWS and image integrity from Azure. And GC, from GCP, they have their own native support for, you know, signing the images. But it all works fine. Yeah, this, these are all the great tools. It works perfectly fine. For, for example, if you are doing in AWS, you know, you can use AWS Image Signer. But since we are on a hybrid cloud, it is not the solution for us. So because it is not the cloud agnostic. Then we are, after everything, you know, we come up with a perfect solution, cosign. Cosign, you know, uh, since we built all the images using OCI, this container signing verification and storage in, o you know, OCI registry, which is handled by Cosign. The multiple advantages, what you can see here is like, it is cloud agnostic and supports containers and blobs. It is not only containers, right? We have multiple uh, other files and platforms we'll have to sign. So Cosign really helped with that. And the signatures are not really attached to the image. So signatures are detached from the image so that even if you are building multiple versions, what is happening is like it, you have the part, particular SHA what you have signed and you can you know, uh, use it for the verification. And you don't need the different signature server and it's a very you know, simpler architecture. So yeah, this is our winner. And what is the, you know, uh, how are we signing containers with the cosign? Uh, it, and when you are building, signing containers, again, we'll have to protect security. It is not like you, you have the private key and public key, I'm signing it from my containers and, you know, from giving it to our customers. So we have to maintain that integrity and security in our system. So, uh, you know, that's why what we have done is like all our, during the CI-CD process, we are just not building the, you know, uh, the, using the private key. So instead of that, what we are doing is like, we are using the projected token. So we are creating the projected volume, and from that, you know, we are authenticating with the AWS KMS server and signing our containers. Yeah, so every time when, you, when the pod gets launched, right, every container gets a new token. And we do not want to share all the, you know, this token with all the namespaces. For example, like, let's say I'm building in namespace A, and namespace B in the cluster, you are building something else. But we do not want to, you know, uh, this token to be uh, worked with the, the uh, namespace B. For that, what we have done is like, we have restricted the access to specific namespace in the cluster. So yeah, everything is working fine. As, as we mentioned, right, X64, everything works. There is a single layer, single share, everything works. But what happens when there is a multi, multi R containers? So you know that for multi R containers, for each platform, there will be a different share. 
for example, SHA-256 for ARM64, and there is a different SHA-256 for uh, X64. So for that, what I had to do is like, you know, cosign kind of supports that. Like once we sign that, it you know, signs all the containers as a top SHA, and each platform it signs as a different SHA. So it really helped us to, you know, solve the multi-arch uh, solution as well. Yeah, this is our, you know, common command what we use to, you know, uh, uh, sign the token, sign, sign our images. Here you can see that we are importing the AWS role, you know, to get the token to sign with our private key. And we have the projected identity token file which is mounted on the Kubernetes containers. So you can see that it is running on the way run secrets and it's a normal token where each pod gets, gets a new token. Yeah. So, okay, now we signed, everything is fine. No, everybody, what they, do, what they do is like, they done the signing and say that, hey, our job is done. But your job is not really done when you, you know, just sign the containers. So you'll have to verify those containers. So, but how we are doing the different verifications? You know that, you know, most of the developers, like there is a development process happens. Then we'll have to push to production. So all the builds or the versions what you publish, which will not go to the, you know, production. So what we do is like, what we do is like you use cosign verify command with the public key and only promote signed containers to production registry. If the containers are not signed, either it's a base images or the third party images or, or even our IP images. If they are not signed, we are not promoting them to, you know, production registry. So like, as, as, as I mentioned, fail build in case of the verification is failed so that, you know, customers will not have to face this kind of issues in the production. And that is happens in the, okay, promotion stage. Yeah, everything is fine. Okay, we have verified it in the promotion stage. What happens if somebody comes and, you know, attack, like customers have not secured that cluster? What happens somebody comes and, you know, attack, try to attack the clusters and try to, you know, change the uh, images in the middle? So for that, what we are doing is like, we are doing the verification in the Kubernetes cluster. And for that, what we are using is Keyverno. Keyverno has a, you know, it has a very good policy administration and we can, you know, with that, we have, we can check chart 256 uh, digest attached to the available or, you know, images, uh, whether images are signed or not. If, if the images are not signed, when the, you know, the containers are not coming up, up at all. Uh, that policy, you know, itself is restricting that, that, you know, uh, pod is not coming up. And, uh, you know, using all this, like, we could able to uh, uh, build all the multi-arch images uh, sign the artifacts and verify all the containers, you know, uh, in the production and the Kubernetes clusters. That way we are maintaining all level of security. And uh, this is our high level overview. As you can see that, uh, as uh, Shiasha mentioned, we are using, you know, uh, hybrid clusters. We are using uh, on-prem clusters and we are using, uh, you know, RKA2 and uh, we have AWS and we have different kind of models. And as we say that, you know, in this one, you can see that we are using publishing container process as part of the build process. And we have installed different things like Scopio, Cosine, and our pod containers. And our pods are as, you know, uh, our Kubernetes cluster is uh, talking to our AWS KMS OIDC server. And from that, uh, we are signing it. And once everything is done, we are publishing into different Docker registries, either it might be Harbor or ECR or different uh, container registries. And once it is done, okay, everything is, that's where the signing part is completed. Everything, the signed artifacts is up uploaded to registry. Then during the deployment side, this is where the CD comes into the picture. So what we are doing is like, whether it's OpenShift or Cloudera provides different solutions for, you know, both private and public clouds. So we have Keyverno installed on the control plane. So it is, you know, uh, checking the policies like saying that, hey, whether this uh, image is signed or not. If the image is not signed, it is not bringing up the ports. So your control plane itself is not com coming up with the new version. And we also have maintained, you know, different policies like pod disruption and other things so that the customers will not get impacted by the, the policies and the new upgrades. Yeah, this is about our overall journey about, you know, how we maintaining our containers with, you know, our old platforms and the hybrid platforms and the new platforms and how we are developing and uh, securing our containers from our CI CD to our, to our customers.
yeah, that's all about uh, our talk. Any questions, we are happy to take. So just for the for the stream, I guess, uh, is it is it like a lot slower when you're using like Docker to build like an ARM image on an x86? Like, and if it's as low, is it worth investing in like native nodes for these builds? So, okay. so in our case, right? So uh, we didn't have too much of native code that is specific to ARM based. So for us, many layers were common between these two, so the builds weren't taking too much of additional time. Yes, we did see a difference. But it's not like you know two x. Okay. Anybody else? All right. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Thanks, uh, uh, Rejects, for hosting us. Thank you very much.